I think we have success. Amazing. I can see here on Zoom is telling us we are live. Um, so hello and welcome everyone to another Facebook Live. I am very excited to have a very special guest with us today. But first, my name is Diana Rassif. I'm the Foundation Manager at the Nerves Foundation, and I will be your host for today's discussion. So our very special guest joining us today is Richard Smith, and Richard is also one of our valued um, ambassadors. But before I tell you more about him, there's just one announcement I would like to make. So for those of you who do not know yet, we are very excited that the NOF Foundation is 10 years old this year. And to celebrate this, we are having a 10-year anniversary breakfast on the 18th of April at the Taj Hotel in Cape Town. And this will be from 9 a.m. till 12 noon. Um, and if you would like to join us, come meet the team, come meet Professor Nose, come chat with us, please um, contact us to book your ticket. And the tickets are all donations towards the Nerf Foundation and the start at 2000 Rand a ticket. And you are welcome to contact us on info at the Nerf Foundation .org. And um, we will be able to provide you with more information. Also, if this is the first time that you are joining us for a live, please let us know in the comments where you're from. Or even if you are a regular, let us know where you're tuning in from. And if you have any questions for our guests today, just pop them in the comment section and we will do our best to get to it. So, without further ado, let me introduce our guest for today. So, Richard Smith is not just a name. He's a testament to the incredible impact that embracing the ketogenic lifestyle can have on one's health and well-being. At the age of 33, Richard received a diagnosis that changed his life. Type 2 diabetes accompanied by a staggering body fat percentage of nearly 60%. He then went on and embarked on an incredible journey of self-discovery and transformation that led him to the doorstep of ketosis. It was this journey that was marked by challenges, setbacks, ultimately and ultimately triumphs. And today he's going to share a little bit more about that with us. He's a nutritionist, a professional athlete and a British champion. And Richard is on the mission to spread the message of real health and nutrition. Through his organization, Keto Pro, he provides not only high quality nutritional products, but also invaluable support and guidance to those seeking to embrace the ketogenic lifestyle. So today we are very excited to have you here with us. Thank you so much for joining us, Richard. Jana, an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on. I've been looking forward to this uh, since you you sent me that email and asked me to come on to speak about this because the topic today is something that is incredibly close to my heart, um, something that I have suffered from extensively. Uh, and that is food addiction uh, or sugar addiction, should we say. Um, but yeah, super excited to get into this one, to get into the weeds. Thank you so much. Yeah, me too. I feel it's not a topic that's, you know, talked about enough, especially within the medical community. It's not necessarily always seen as, a, like sugar is seen as an addiction. And I know there's a lot of people doing a lot of important work around this trying to create awareness and trying to get this into the medical textbooks and to get it as a proper diagnosis for a type of addiction. And thank you also for all the work that you do around that. But I think maybe to start us off, you know, I, I, I did mention a little bit about your background, but perhaps you can tell us a little bit in more detail, kind of your journey. Um, how did it happen that you ended up being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes and kind of how did you make all those lifestyle changes? Because at the moment, you you know, you're obviously healthy, you look great. And if I look at that picture there in the background, that's also you, right? That is, that was, that was me. Oh, I, yeah, yeah well, that, that was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us a little bit more about that. So, yeah, it, I mean, it, many of the listeners are probably bored senseless with me talking about my, myself, but in my mid to late 20s, I was clinically obese. 
type 2 diabetic, has suffered with chronic fatigue, depression, anxiety, arthritic pains, daily debilitating migraines that, that would make me blind, for which I was on three different medications for. Um, I, I was living in in boxes. My life was spent living in, in boxes because of depression and anxiety. Um, I would leave my house, which was my box. I would jump into my metal box. I would drive my metal box to another big box, i.e. my place of work. And then I would go into a small box inside this bigger box. And I would perform this in reverse at the end of the day. Um, I would struggle to leave my house if there was someone in the street, if my neighbors were out or if there was somebody walking past or a car driving past. And it's not because I was rude but I never felt worthy of the company of others. Uh, I didn't like the way that I felt, didn't like the way that I looked. Um, and I was on lots of medication for, for these things, for depression and anxiety, but I, ha I had nothing to be depressed about. You know, I, I had a very well-paid job at the time. Um, not so much now since I've come away from <laughs> and I do this, but, um, you know, I, I had a very well-paid job, um, loving family, and I had nothing to be depressed about. But, you know, later on, I learned that this was all linked to the food that I was consuming. And we can get into the weeds in regards to this as, as, as the conversation unfolds. But um, an incredibly long story short, I was overweight. I hated the way that I looked. And I knew that bread made me feel uncomfortable. Bread used to bloat me severely. So I stopped eating bread. and. Within two months, the bloat within my stomach had come right down. I had lost um, somewhere in the region of two stone, I think, um, just from cutting out bread. Nothing else. I wasn't dieting. I wasn't restricting. I just took bread out of my diet. And in there, I was introduced to the ketogenic lifestyle through a friend of mine. And this is going back an awfully long time in, in which the ketogenic lifestyle was not very well known, especially within the UK. And the information available on the internet was uh, was scarce at best, uh, a lot of misinformation. Um, but I decided to persevere with it. Um, I looked into what the ketogenic lifestyle was. Um, I began to pursue this. I It wasn't easy, and we can get into this as, as the conversation uh, d develops. Um, but I persevered through thick and thin in order to become ketogenic. And the super long story short, after 12 months, I had lost 107 pounds, reversed my diabetes. Um, my aches and pains had gone away. Depression and anxiety was now manageable. Um, I'm speaking with you today. I do lot, lots of public speaking events. Um, I go live, you know, a, a number of times a week. Um, I've given public speaking events to hundreds and hundreds of people. These are things that I could not have dreamt of doing um, prior to living this lifestyle. And it sounds too good to be true, but what we put into our body makes all of the difference. If we put the wrong fuel in, then you know we, we, the output is wrong. If we put petrol into our diesel car, uh, our car doesn't work so well. Uh, and it's the same with our body. If we put toxins in, then it makes us sick and well. Uh, everything that I was suffering from was linked to my diet. Uh, it wasn't to do with not moving enough because I've always been active. It wasn't to do with, you know, and that's the big misconception, isn't it? Where people say that, you know, you need to, you need to move more, eat less and move more. And, and that's the, the big message that, um, that most establishments put, put, put out there. But if you have to work out or to move to maintain a healthy lifestyle, then your diet is wrong. Um, now, my weight moves between um, an upper and lower limit, and it doesn't fluctuate beyond that, regardless of how much I eat or how much I train. And again, you know, we can get into the science behind that now, but it's, it le it's led me down to a route of wanting to teach the world about my secret. I felt that I'd found this secret that nobody else was talking about. So I retrained as a nutritionist. Um, not that what they were teaching me was correct, but still it was a, a hoop that I needed to jump through. Uh, I quit my job. Um, I began coaching. Uh, and in that space, 
uh, the business was was developed Keto Pro, in which I do nutrition coaching for people, and I help people maintain the lifestyle because this isn't about um, being super strict either. We don't have to. There's a lot of misconceptions in regards to what the ketogenic lifestyle is or being healthy, and I think we get pigeonholed in in regards to what is ketogenic and not, you know, and. Ketosis is a metabolic state. It's so a natural metabolic state. It's the metabolic state we're born in, and it's the metabolic state that we've evolved in almost our entire existence. Eating a certain food doesn't um, govern whether we are ketogenic because technically every food is, is a ketogenic food. But some compounds or non-foods, shall we call them, are not so good for us, and others are incredibly good for us. And it's through these education pieces can we teach people what real food is and what to limit and hopefully maybe as they gravitate down their journey completely remove um and that's what i do i try to teach people and allow them to make better choices and maintain um what i believe to be the healthiest lifestyle or the healthiest metabolic state which is that of of a ketogenic lifestyle I mean, it must be a very fulfilling job that you have now, being able to do that and being able to kind of see the changes and also experiencing it yourself. And I actually want to go back. You know, you mentioned it so many years ago when you started this journey and you said you kind of heard about the ketogenic uh, diet from a friend. But I want to ask, like, you know, as you embarked on this journey, what type of challenges did you find yourself experiencing? And this is this. And when I say challenges, obviously, you know, adherence to the diet, all those types of things. But you mentioned you reverse your type 2 diabetes. So I'm assuming there must have been some like a doctor involved. Were there any kind of, you know, interesting discussions happening there? Um, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So um, my doctor was not on board with this whatsoever. Um, as a side note, my doctor is uh, incredibly overweight. Um, and I don't mean that in a negative way. It's just sometimes if somebody's giving you advice, then you know maybe they should practice what they preach. And if they are, then it's clearly not working. Um, look, I, I did this off my own back because my doctor and my family were concerned with the amount of saturated fats that I was consuming because we are told saturated fats are detrimental to our health because it elevates our cholesterol, allegedly. Uh, we're told to consume vegetable oils and seed oils. Uh, we're told to avoid salt. Um, we're told to consume our whole grains um, and all of these things. And, and red meat, we're told to avoid red meat. Every one of these things is incorrect. Um, and these these things have been proven with clinical trials, research papers, double blind, randomized control trials. And they, they are out there in abundance. But earlier on my journey, they weren't so available. I didn't know how to find them. All all I had to go on was the advice that my doctor was giving me, which was that living this lifestyle is is incredibly dangerous and it's going to kill you. Um, and my family were also concerned. But after I had gone through what's called keto flu, and and we can get into this as we you know as the conversation develops a little bit further. But the keto flu is not very nice to put it at that. But we we, we can speak about this now. But I came through the keto flu. I felt the best that I'd ever felt. I felt the, the healthiest and fittest that I'd ever felt in my life. And not one person could tell me that what I was doing was incorrect because of the way that I felt. This brain fog that I'd had my entire life was lifted. I had energy in abundance. These aches and pains had gone away. I'd lost a lot of weight, reverse diabetes. My migraines, which were the worst thing for me, my migraines I had every single day. And... I had this continuous headache and it was debilitating to the point where I was on three medications. And if if I'd slipped or missed a medication, the migraine would develop to a point where I would become blind and I would be bedridden for as much as three days. So I was on meds after meds after meds in order to keep this at bay. They went away. My migraine, it's something I had suffered from since the age of maybe 14 every day. Um, just disappeared. Aches and pains, all of these things went away. So when I went back to my doctor, um, I technically reversed diabetes because my blood glucose. Now it takes it takes like three to six months between testing to 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 establish whether that's been 
um, reversed. But when I went back, my blood glucose was now in a normal range. Um, and he said, you know, what you've done is fantastic, but you need to come off this because it's not healthy. And I, it just didn't compute. It didn't make sense to me how something that had just changed my life could not be healthy. That was the last time I went to the doctor. <laughs> so I've um, I've been back once since, uh, but to a different doctor. And that was because I had an injury to my arm, um, which required, required surgery. But that, that was the last time. In that moment, I realized that I was not getting help from, from my medical professional. Um, and it was in that moment I realized that my doctor, at least, was not trained in nutrition. Um, doctors are trained in, in, in medicine, in medication. And I work with lots of doctors. Um, I've got a lot of respect for, for doctors, but they're not nutritionists. They are trained in medicine. And the issue is, if we go to a doctor with a problem, um, they don't have the time to look at the root cause. You know, if you go with a headache, they'll offer you a headache tablet. If you go with inflammation, it's an anti-inflammatory. If you go with depression, it's an antidepressant. But what's causing these things? And everything comes back down to this one thing, and it's the food that we put into our body. There are other contributing factors, but we can get into the, into the weeds in regards to this. But the food we eat massively affects our neurotransmitters. Our neurotransmitters are the compounds that allow us to feel happy, to feel sad, so on and so forth. Um, and we can we can get into the science in, in regards to this if, if you'd like to. Um, but when these are affected, then our mood is affected. And this is what leads to things like depression, anxiety, um, and, and food addiction or sugar addiction. Um, but yeah, th that, that was my journey to that point. Yeah, I wanted to ask how's your doctor doing now, but I mean, since you haven't really been going back. So it's my doctor is, is local to me. Um, I haven't seen him, um, but friends have, and I think he's, he's put even more weight on. Um, and I don't mean that negatively. Um, I just wish that for me, a, a doctor or a scientist should be able to step back, look at the information present. Because what I offered to do at that time was I um I mentioned that I was living this ketogenic lifestyle, and it sounded absolutely crazy. Yeah, and I, I was said, thinking you you know such a great example of what's possible. Maybe it influenced in some way. Well, and and this is what the hope was. I I offered to do some sort of uh, follow up and some sort of trial with it within the surgery, um, you know, where I would maintain the lifestyle and I could go back for regular blood tests and 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 see how my health and well being unfolded over months and years. They, he wasn't interested. The nurses there weren't interested, and it's it was incredibly disheartening. And and I the, the real. I, I, it's not to say that their heart isn't in the right place because I don't believe you become a doctor or a nurse, you know, because you don't care. You, I think you do these things because you care. But the the fact of the matter is that they have so much work to do that the time just wasn't available. But it was a shame because this was revolutionary. You know, when I was going through it within, you know, S South Wales, I was the only person within the UK that I knew at the time who was, and but there were others. It's just now social media has allowed um, those networks to um, to be created. But it's it was a lonely place when everybody is telling you that what you were doing is detrimental to your health. It's incredibly difficult to block those out and persevere along your journey. Um, but I did it through, I, I did it intelligently. Um, I, I was always testing my hormones and my bloods, uh, and that allowed me, that opened up a whole other rabbit hole in regards to understanding bloods and, and the ranges that, you know, we should be in. Um, and probably a conversation for another day, but it's, um, it was, it was life changing. Um, I just wish that more of the medical professionals were open to suggestion and, and to see what is right before them, because, this is life changing. I now work with, I've worked with thousands of of clients um, who have all benefited from living this lifestyle, if not completely reversed all of the issues that they came to see me with. The people who have stuck to the to you know to the lifestyle, um, and the, and the fact is, you don't even have to be that strict. And again, this is something we can probably get into more detail as as uh, as we go through.
Yeah, I feel like, I mean, there's so many interesting topics that already just came out of this conversation. We might end up like, feel like we need more time than just an hour. But before I uh, go into some more questions that I have for you, I see we've got quite a few people saying hi and um, here in the comments. So Glauce Brooks is saying hello, uh, but she's saying she's starting to work now, so she'll watch later, but I see this question from them, but I'll, I'll get to that now. Then Carl is saying morning, listening in from South Wales, UK. Kat is saying first time listening live, I'm from South Wales. Um, Elizabeth tuning in from Norway. Maria's also here, all the way from West Dorset, UK. Um, and maybe I can just read her comment here. She's saying, Rich's story ha uh, got to be one of the most insp inspirational. He certainly inspired and educated me in my own recovery from food addiction. Following all the presentations from the likes of Rich and also the Nurk Foundation, not only have I lost weight and healed from 30 years of autoimmune issues, but I've also been inspired to learn more and have just finished the Nutrition Network Advisor Training and have signed up for more courses. Thank you all for what you're doing. You're the help. You are all helping significantly change lives. I, for one, and I'm very grateful for the life I've been given back. Thank you, Maria, for sharing that with us. What a fantastic Amanda, comment also from Dorset. Um, she's saying she's been looking forward to this live. I follow Richard and I use Keto Pro products and for many years now offering following Prof Nokes. Amazing. And Carolyn joining us from South Africa. So Richard, I want to talk a little bit about food addiction because I mean, that's why we're here. So would you say, would you do you see yourself as a sugar addict or food addict in some way? Or do you see yourself you were one? Is Are you still one? Chat a little bit about that. What is that? So, you know, we, I, I believe we are all sugar addicts. Um, and the reason being is sugar is a drug. And we know this from, from testing. There's been a, a number of tests uh, done on rats in particular in regards to artificial sweeteners and sugar in which um, they fed them artificial sweeteners and sugar uh, and cocaine. And the rats would work harder to get to the artificial sweeteners and, and the sugar over, over, over the cocaine. Um, and the reason being is that it affects um, the, the prefrontal cortex in the brain. So the prefrontal cortex is the brain's brakes, if you like. Uh, that's what tells us to, to think rationally. And through our evolutionary period, we would have gone to dangerous places in order to, to get and reach honey because it was essential for our survival at that time, i.e. You know, we would consume these compounds at the end of uh, summer in order to fatten us up ready for a cold winter. Um, but now you know, we've taken this to another level and we consume these compounds all year round, um, which is detrimental to our health. But you know, glucose is essential for life. Um, but we can make glucose. There's no requirement for exogenous carbohydrate or carbohydrate from a, an external source. The body will make all of the sugar or glucose that it needs. Um, the brain needs a little bit and the, the, the erythrocyte or red blood cell needs a little bit. But the body, again, can make this. Um, but it, it most certainly is. It's, it's sugar it exhibits these, uh, these drug-like conditions. Um, it blocks all sorts of pathways in the body. Um, now, when we look at the way that the, the body works, the brain works, the brain will create neurotransmitters, um, catecholamines and indolamines through a process called catecholaminergic neurotransmitter synthesis. So these are things like epinephrine, norepinephrine, um, uh, serotonin, um, so on and so forth. And these are created from our aromatic amino acids, uh, which are tyrosine, tryptophan, and phenylalanine, which we can get from the foods that we eat. So we consume these compounds, and the body will create these neurotransmitters, uh, essential neurotransmitters, and we need these for our survival. The issue is that to create these neurotransmitters, we need cofactors, things like zinc, iron, vitamin B12, vitamin B3, B6, so on and so forth. Now, a standard diet that is high in grains, for example, um, is deficient within these compounds for, for a number of reasons. When we look at grains, grains are sprayed with a compound called glyphosate. 
um, and, and other vegetables too, but grains are predominantly sp sprayed with this compound. Now, glyphosate affects uh, bacteria, but we have bacteria in our gut, uh, and it, it affects that glyphosate blocks a pathway within the body called the shikimate pathway. The shikimate pathway goes on to create these um, these neurotransmitters. It goes on to allow us to, to convert these aromatic amino acids into our neurotransmitters. 95% of our neurotransmitters are produced within the gut. So predominantly, you know, they're produced from the foods that we eat. If this glyphosate is blocking the shikimate pathway, we can no longer produce these neurotransmitters. So that's one thing to bear in mind. Uh, this is why grains can be detrimental. Grains also contain compounds uh, such as lectins and phytic acid. Uh, phytic acid has, has been shown to block the absorption of zinc, iron, and magnesium by as much as 100%. So it isn't just enough to consume a food that is incredibly nutritious. What we co-consume with that food has a detrimental impact uh, on how that product is, is absorbed within the body. And these lectins that we've, we consume within the grains, they bind to the microvilli lining the gut. So the microvilli are like little fingers within our gut. Um, the, the nutrients that we consume will bind to the microvilli, then they're absorbed and synthesized within the body. But the lectins will bind to the microvilli, reducing that surface area, therefore uh, reducing the amount of nutrients that, that are being absorbed and then hindering our ability to create these neurotransmitters and also um, preventing us from receiving that satiety signaling that we need. Um, so these these lectins also block leptin, which is a satiety hormone. Leptin is released when we've consumed food and it's told us that we are satiated, we receive the nutrients that we need. So lectins block leptin. So this one compound that we consume that contains lectins and phytic acid blocks the absorption of all of these things, blocks the satiety signaling, and all of these things lead to, to us over consuming food. Through, through, so that's one mechanism. Now, the other mechanism is there that the neurotransmitters are not being produced. Now, we are hardwired to chase these neurotransmitters, particularly things like serotonin and dopamine. Um, we are hardwired to chase them, and, and they've been essential for the survival of the human race for our entire existence. Um, now, when we consume sugar, sugar will give us a dopamine fix, um, and, and it's similar with serotonin. So with, with serotonin, like serotonin is the neurotransmitter that leads to, to positive sensations and relaxation, satiety. Uh, it's also converted into melatonin, which help, helps us sleep. Um, but without this, this can lead to things like depression, um, insomnia, and, and eating disorders. Uh, and there are other factors as well. So if we are stressed, if we are overtraining, so long periods of physical or psychological stress will produce hormones such as cortisol and adrenaline, which will interfere with the synthesis of serotonin. Um, and again, that will lead to things like depression, anxiety, and, and um, so on and so forth. But this serotonin is produced from an amino acid called tryptophan. It's created into serotonin by B vitamins uh, and magnesium. Um, so a deficiency is going to cause an issue with, with serotonin production. Um, if we are low in tryptophan, then the body will also convert any available um, B, uh, any any sorry any any available tryptophan into into B vitamins, particularly B three, um, and I think it's something like a sixty to one ratio. So this this niacin vitamin B three is essential again for all of these these cofactors these these um, um, cofactors in in production of the neurotransmitters. But by doing so, we deplete tryptophan, which also leads to depression. Um, but when we consume sugar, now when we consume sugar, the pancreas releases insulin. Insulin drives all of the amino acids in the blood into the cells except for tryptophan, leaving tryptophan available for synthesis into serotonin, which is why when we consume a sugary treat, we get this, this, this fix and this release of serotonin. And now we're stuck in a cycle because... Every time we consume that sugary treat, or it could be bread, or because all carbohydrates break down into sugar, and that's a very important point to understand. Bread, pasta, rice, all of these compounds break down into sugar. It's all sugar. Just because we're not eating sugar in its raw form, it doesn't mean that we're not consuming where we co-consume or co consume these other products. 
So your go-to may be a cake. It may be some cereal. It may be, you know, even bananas and, and fruit and, and other, other compounds. But when we reach for these, these treats, if you like, these sugary treats, again, it drives tryptophan, uh, all the other amino acids into the cell, leaving leave tryptophan. And this is what leads to this, uh, this rush in serotonin. Um, but now we're stuck in, in, in this cycle. So breaking that cycle is, is very important. Um, and it, it, this is a drug. So the only way to, to, to combat this drug addiction is by stopping it dead in its tracks. Um, you can wean off, which is probably more beneficial if you are consuming medications. So we would increment these changes slowly. But, you know, we wouldn't tell an alcoholic to start reducing alcohol, you know, i.e. drink less on the weekend uh, bit by bit. So sometimes removing this compound completely is going to confer the best benefit. But what we need to understand is that we need these neurotransmitters. We need to produce these neurotransmitters. All of these B vitamins and these, these amino acids are found in animal proteins. Um, the issue is if we overconsume vegetables, for example, and I'm not against vegetables, but what we need to understand is meat contains every vitamin and mineral that we need, not just to survive, but thrive. Vitamin A down to zinc and, and other compounds, which we just cannot get from, from plants. So we should be building our meals based on animal proteins. If we're consuming veg, make, make, make the vegetables a smaller portion because all of these nutrients are coming from the animal proteins. Um, these vitamins and minerals allow us to, to create these neurotransmitters. But if we are consuming compounds that are blocking our body's ability to create these, these neurotransmitters, then that leads to depression and anxiety. So again, we're stuck in this circle and we need to stop that circle. And there are things that we can put in place in order to do that, but I'll, I'll let you jump on um, and then maybe we can get into some of the things that we can implement in order to um, to, to help tackle I mean, thank you for just explaining that in such an understandable way, you know. Um, but I, it's so interesting, and maybe you can shed some light on it. I was, I mean, under the impression mostly that, you know, when you consume sugary foods or high-carb foods, it's more like you get a dopamine kick. But you mentioned now it's more it's more serotonin. And, and dopamine, yeah. So serotonin and dopamine, yeah. And again, we're hardwired to chase these dopamine fixes. Um, so if we are not creating dopamine through the catecholaminergic neurotransmitter synthesis, again, you know, so dopamine and serotonin are the two main ones that we, you know, ser dopamine is the reward pathway. Um, if we don't get our dopamine fix naturally through consuming the animal proteins, then we chase that dopamine fix through the sugary treats or bread, pasta, rice, et cetera, because it all converts in, into, into sugar. Um, so this is why it's incredibly important to, to reach the production of the neurotransmitters naturally. Um, and I think in there lies the key, because when we understand that the food we consume creates these neurotransmitters, we can put things in place in order to prevent us from, from con consuming that, that sugar. Every time we consume that sugary treat, we're back in this cycle and it's breaking that cycle that is incredibly important. We need to stop that cycle in its tracks. And there are there are a few things that we can do in order to combat that. Not having that compound available to consume is number one. So if you have the ability to remove all of these things from, from the house, um, you know, do that because you are far less likely to wake up at two in the morning, jump into your car and drive to the local shop to get, you know, your sugary treat. Uh, you'll be more likely to to persevere without it. So not having it available, it is difficult if you have family members or children who are consuming because not everybody in the same family is is living the lifestyle. So it, you know it can be difficult. And what you do there is you have your your cupboard or your area within the fridge, and this is your food. Um, and you just understand that the other cupboards that are full of these compounds are not yours. You're not to go in there. Um, and it is difficult because initially this sh sugar addiction screams to you in the middle of the night. You'll wake up in the middle of, middle of the night craving these compounds. But there are things you can do to combat the cravings as well. Um, things like 
going out into the sun. So early in the morning, later in the evening, um, UVA rays through the eyes increase MSH, melanocyte stimulating hormone, which helps us combat these cravings, um, increasing uh, cholecystokinin, which we can increase through consuming omega-3s and saturated fats. This also helps us uh, increase that feeling of satiation. Um, becoming ketogenic also helps us. It increases uh, the glutamate to GABA ratio, so it helps us combat um, the anxiety and depression side, and it also increases uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is helps us with that inhibition control. So when we are struggling for a craving, um, being ketogenic, the production of ketones flooding the brain, this beta hydroxybutyrate allows us um, to to help combat these things. Yes, we need an element of self control. There is no magic compound. We do need that element of self control. All of these things accumulated can help. Um, and we can also take uh, an amino acid supplement when we get a craving in form of glutamine. Um, glutamine, we can add to water and drink, and that also helps curb these cravings. So there's a number of things to do. And what, what I did early on in my journey is that, you know, so my lifestyle now is predominantly carnivore. So I've, I, I'm, I'm carnivore. All I eat is meat, um, predominantly. But what I did along my journey, I made these incremental changes. I didn't just wake up one day eating nothing but meat. Uh, and again, my, my metabolic state is still ketosis. And this is a common misconception in regards to keto and carnivore. The metabolic state is the same. Um, and we can get into that if, if you like. But it's I'm still ketogenic. It's just carnivore is another subsection of being ketogenic. Um, but what I did along my journey, I had... Um, uh, keto treats, if you like, you know, I, I looked for keto recipes um, that would swap out compounds that I was consuming. So, you know, I would consume cauliflower mashed with butter and use that as a mashed potato. Um, you know, I would do uh, cauliflower rice. I would keep keto bars and things. And yes, your your diet and lifestyle is going to be better if you remove all of these things. But these 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 choices, these tools were exactly that. They were pivotal tools in my transition in order to gravitate into a healthier lifestyle. Instead of reaching for a Mars bar or a Twix or whatever your sugary treat is, whatever your go-to is, I would reach for a, a keto bar. So it was low in carbohydrate. Uh, it made me feel like I was having something without consuming uh, you know, all of those other toxic compounds and, and, and high, high volumes of sugar. Um, and, and that's what I did. I put these little things in place, um, and I made sure that wherever I went, I had alternatives to consume. So I would, I would boil eggs every day, about six eggs. I would boil them in the night and the next day, you know, they'd be red. I would take those with me in a, in a Tupperware box, uh, along with some cubes of cheese. Uh, and again, these saturated fats and omega-3s. Uh, increase BDNF, which allow us to combat these cravings. These All of these things help combat these cravings for sugary treats. Um, and it's all about it's all about exactly that, putting these things in place to allow you to combat these cravings. But you must also understand that if you fought, when you fall off the wagon, because I, I have fallen off the wagon so many times, it's, we're only human. And it's important to understand that it isn't game over. Don't just write the day off. Don't write the weekend off. You know, we've got this this thing of me that the diet starts on Monday. Just because you've had that treat now, think of it as a mental reset. You've just had that mental reset. Now you're ready to push forward and persevere. You have you haven't undone all of that hard work. You know, everything that you have banked is 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 there. There's a there's a net gain to to what you have put in. Um, and you just need to get back on it and make these changes. It's, it, this is all about the rule and not the exception. So if you are to fall off or have that treat or go to a wedding and have some wedding cake or it's someone's birthday, um, that day, just write it off and you go back to consuming healthy food. Uh, and we can go into, again, more detail in regards to what healthy food is, if, if you like, Yana. I mean, that's so interesting because what I'm clearly hearing is that planning is so important and having alternatives and having a clear 
kind of idea of what is it that you're going to do when you embark on this new journey? How are you going to try and stay clear of those type of sleep stuff and to avoid that? And like you say, it's a journey. I will also always tell people, remember, this is a journey. There's no, it's not an end destination. Um, there's always going to be something else or something different. Or like you, like you said, you're now moving more towards a carnivorous diet. So maybe, you know, as time goes by, you adapt your diet and you change it. Because it's such an individualized approach. But <clears throat> you mentioned something now that I want to bring in the, 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 the question that we got from Glauce, because I think it really ties in with what you were saying now about falling off the wagon and planning and everything. And she was saying, um, morning from Brazil, I have a very difficult relationship with food. Being on this diet since 2022, lost a lot of weight and haven't really been challenged until last Christmas when my husband and I visited his mom. She simply did not accept my way of eating and at the end I gave in and now it's been difficult to go back. Mind you, my problems are not with sugar or processed food, really, but with habits. For example, even if I'm not hungry, I can't break the pattern of having lunch or eating at night. Please help. I need direction. Yeah, so it is, it's a difficult one. And it's one that I have experienced so many times. Um, Christmas, you know, just gone. Um, my little girl wanted me, I've got a, a nine-year-old daughter, and she wanted us as a family to eat a real traditional Christmas dinner. I was happy just to have steak, but this is what she wanted. So I, 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 I cooked this Christmas dinner, but she wanted me to eat this with her. Um, and I'm metabolically flexible. So my body is now healed. Uh, my The lining of my gut is now healed, which is what these these compounds, the lectins cause in, in, in you know, within wheat um, and other foods also. But uh, once you heal the gut, your body deals with these compounds a lot better. Once you're more insulin sensitive, you know, when you do put these compounds in, your body deals with it a lot better. The part that it doesn't deal with is exactly this. And this is the sugar addiction. I consumed some potatoes, some vegetables, and I had cravings for six weeks for sugar after. Um, and I'm I'm what I would call highly adapted. I've been on this lifestyle for a long time and it was tough. Um, I wish I hadn't put them in, but it was worth it because it was a family meal. And, you know, my wife and my little girl were, were over the moon that we all had this Christmas dinner. Um, but look, look, it is it is super difficult and it, it's habits. But again, it's these neurotransmitters. So we are chasing this dopamine fix again. So we've broken um, or we, we're, we're now back into this cycle. So it's all about breaking this cycle. So removing those compounds from from the house, if you can, has, has got to be number one. Um Eating set times, uh, you know, fasting is a fantastic tool. And what we want to do is when we when we eat at specific times, the body releases ghrelin about 10 to 15 minutes prior to a meal to tell us that food is coming. This is why we get these these hunger pangs. Um, so if you can implement uh, some form of, of intermittent fasting and try to skip these meals by maybe eating your last meal later in the night. So... And, and this is when I consume my food. So I would consume my meal quite late in the evening. Uh, and I believe that that's probably one of the better times to consume food, contrary to popular belief, because this is when the body's healing and repairing. But again, that's a debate for another day. But if you eat closer to, to the evening, as as the lion does, and this is what we see with, with carnivores all over the world, lions, tigers, when they catch the prey, they eat their food and they have a nap. You know, and, and we, we, we are the same, but we don't. We don't. We don't do this, you know, we don't, we don't perform this practice. But I do because I can't sleep without it. So eat later towards the evening. That will allow you to extend your fast and maybe break past breakfast time. And all you need to do is move it by an hour. And then the next day, bump it forward. So in, if, if your breakfast time is, say, 8 a.m., if you are eating breakfast, um, then bump it to seven and then move it out to nine. And this way you're going to you're going to confuse ghrelin. And now the activation of ghrelin is massively reduced and you begin not to, to get these hunger pangs. Um, getting up early in the morning and again, getting out in, into the sun if you if you if you can. Um, the sun isn't. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's not very. Uh, 
it's not good in the UK at the moment. But the sun is always there. These UVA rays are always coming through through the, the clouds, and it's important to get this UVA through through the eyes. So not wearing sunglasses, for example. We don't want to do this in um, the middle of the day where the sun is the highest in the sky because this is when UVB is at its strongest. Um, UVA carries lots of benefits in regards to um, allowing us to produce vitamin D um, and uh, increase in nitric oxide. This increase in nitric oxide is a potent vasodilator and it leads to longevity and, and feeling good. Um, so... It's true what they say, you know, get, getting out into the sun does act, you know, change your mood. Um, super beneficial. So if you can do that, get out early in the morning or late in the evening, uh, mix in the meal times. And again, when you get these cravings, try consuming some saturated fats or omega-3s. Because again, this is going to allow your body um, you know, to increase uh, BDNF and, and uh, alter the glutamate to GABA ratio. So, so one stimulates and, and one relaxes. Um, all of these things allow us to combat these 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 sugar cravings, um, and when you do get these cravings, have have something on on hand. You know, have a my go to, um, and I'm as I say, I'm predominantly carnivore. I'm quite partial to Greek yogurt, so it's that that's my little treat. Um, so I've always got a tub of Greek yogurt in the fridge, and if I want something a little sweeter, then that's what I will do. Um, and if that's all you have to worry about in regards to the food you were consuming, then there's very little to worry about. Um, but that's what I do. I've always got this in there. Uh, cheese is another go-to. Now, cheese is is highly addictive because it contains a compound called casein, which converts into caseomorphine, um, which is an addictive compound. So what, what I did initially is I transitioned from my sugar addiction into this di addiction for cheese. Um now, there are reasons maybe to limit cheese, but cheese works incredibly well for me. And this is by far um, uh, a better substance to, to consume than, than sugar. Um, cheese consume, uh, contains protein, it contains fat. And it's important to remember every cell in your body is made of protein. Every cell in your body is made of fat. So when we are consuming food, we want to be thinking what is in that food. Try not to think about the vitamins and minerals. Think about protein and fat. Nature provides us with this perfectly packaged present. Everything that nature provides from the animal kingdom comes with protein and fat. An egg is protein and fat. Chicken breast with the skin on is protein and fat. Salmon is protein and fat. Beef is protein and fat. Everything is protein and fat. But in our wisdom, what do we do? We, we get this, this protein compound, um, chicken. We take the skin off. We remove the fat. The, the, the protein needs to be consumed with fat. The fat allows us to assimilate those proteins and amino acids. They work synergistically within the body to help us heal and repair. Uh, and we need the fat to assimilate our, our fat-soluble vitamins, vitamin A, D, E, and K, um, which comes on to supplementation of vitamins. You know, the, the supplementation, you don't need to supplement with, with vitamins, but if you do, if you supplement with vitamin D and you're not consuming fat, then it's not doing an awful lot in your body. But again, that's probably a conversation for another day. But try to gravitate into consuming a, a, a source that contains protein and fat. And cheese is, is, a, is, is a nice, easy one. And again, eggs is a nice, easy one. You need to break this cycle. You need to break the cycle. Make yourself accountable. Um, join a, a local group. Um, you know, it could be a Facebook group. I've got a private group. Um, I've got a private group on uh, on school, a platform called School. Um I'll post the link to that in the comments later if, if you'd like me to, Yana. Um, it's it's a private group. It's free to join. And what we do within the group is we offer support. So it's, it's a network, um, you know, uh, that allows you to ask questions and to keep people updated. And, and again, you can do this on your Facebook group, no doubt. I'm sure you wouldn't mind you know, post it on the group and saying, you know, look, I've had a bad day today. This is what I'm craving. Make yourself accountable on a daily basis. It could even be a friend, you know, um, reach out to a friend on a daily basis. And when, even when you have fallen off the wagon, you, you openly tell this person or the platform or the group that you have consumed this compound, tell them how you feel, take note of how you feel, because these compounds, they give you that dopamine and serotonin release and then 
bang, it crashes and you become worse off than when you started. And then you crave this compound again. And again, we're back to this, this, this cycle. We need to break this cycle. Every time you speak to a friend or a platform uh, in regards to the foods that you've consumed that you shouldn't, um, it makes you feel, you know, that you, you don't want to be consuming them. So it, it, and nobody's there to judge these people within the group are all there on the same journey and everybody understands. And it's all about supporting uh, and allowing, uh, you know, each, each and every one of us to, to move forward, but making yourself accountable. So, so there's a few little tricks there. Um, unfortunately, without coming over there and cooking for that person, you know, and making sure that that's, it that does involve a little bit of, of, of self-control. You need to want to do this. You can obviously do it because you have been ketogenic for such a long time. You just need to remember how you feel and break that cycle. So implement those changes um, and I'm sure you'll be fine. Thank you for that very comprehensive answer. And I just quickly want to mention something that you now spoke about that for me was very interesting and it's the idea of eating later at night versus not. And um, I've also been doing predominantly like a carnivorous diet and what I've known. And I generally also like intermittent fast, so I, I also do some extended fasting. And what I've noticed, um, particularly over the past few months, if I were to eat early in the earlier in the day, I would become extremely tired and sluggish. And I was very worried about it at some point. I was thinking, like, is there something wrong with me? Do I have hyperglycemia? Like, what happened? Why is this now happening? And I, I haven't really experienced, experienced it that much before. And then I listened to, I think it was a podcast by Dr. Anthony Chafee. And then he spoke about it, like he was also saying he only eats quite late in the afternoon or evening. And then, you know, it helps sleep better. And when I do extended fast, I cannot sleep at night. There were times in the past where I struggled so badly that I would get up and go eat something just to be able to fall asleep. So it's a very interesting concept, and I don't think like there's not a lot of people talking about it yet. No, and it you know it it doesn't work for everyone. We're all individual, um, and and even fasting, extended fasting, doesn't seem to work for women as well as it does for men. Uh, and I think this comes back to you know our evolutionary process in regards to the, the men would go out and hunt and spend hours and days even tracking and hunting an animal. Um, you know, while while the women within the tribe would be prepping the food ready for for the hunter's return, but they would be eating, you know, before this. So so they would be breaking their fast well before. Um, so fasted works incredibly well, but what, what I'm not against, you know, uh, women not fasting either. Um, I think consuming two to three meals a day is perfectly fine. And what people want to understand also, and this is going a little bit off piece to you, but. When we fast, we, we fast for a number of things. Autophagy, mitophagy, brown fat activation, lipolysis, insulin sensitivity, all of which are elicited through being ketogenic. So ketosis is a, a fasting mimicking state. So when we are ketogenic, we are still benefiting from all of these, these mechanisms without, without having to fast. Yes, you can increase the state of autophagy, but our ability to reach what's called max autophagy happens a lot sooner. Um, and it, it's still okay to throw a fast in now and again. But what I seem to find is a lot of issues for women sticking to the lifestyle comes down to trying to, to do this fasting. Um, you don't have to fast. So the, the key to this is eat when you're hungry. If you're not hungry, don't eat. Uh, and if you're full, when you, when you are eating, then stop eating, you know, put that meal to one side, put pop it in the fridge and go back to it later when you are hungry. You don't have to track. This isn't about um, tracking, you know, calories or macros. You don't have to track. It's about eating real food uh, and real food predominates from, from animal proteins. Um, you know, if you, if you are eating vegetables, preference the veg that grows above the ground. Um, you know, keep the fruit to a minimal. If you are going to consume fruit, you know, go, go towards the berries. Uh, but again, predominate animal proteins. And I, I can't emphasize that enough. And I think there's, you know, you, you, we get boxed into these different, these different boxes in regards to what ketosis is or the ketogenic lifestyle. And look, again, it's all about the rule and not the exception. If you can do 
if you can do these two things, and that is if you can remove grains and you can remove your seed oils, you are going to be exponentially fitter and healthier just by doing those two things. If you can put an, a third in, which is restricting carbohydrates, and number four, increasing animal proteins, then you're going to be right at the other end of this level without even having to think about things. Now, grains are detrimental. Um, they don't carry any benefit. They cause this intestinal permeability, which leads to autoimmune issue. And again, you know, we've we covered earlier in 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 the call that um, it blocks the absorption and our ability to create these neurotransmitters. And these seed oils that we're told are good for us and heart healthy, they contain phytosterols. They artificially lower our body's natural cholesterol. Cholesterol is essential for life. Every cell in the body is made of cholesterol. Uh, it's essential for cell formation, cell communication, nutrient absorption, nutrient transportation, the production of hormones. This is why later in life, a lifetime of lack of saturated fat has led to uh, hormonal issues. So we need these saturated fats and it's essential for healing. So we need we need these compounds within the body and, and those vegetable oils will do that. And th the reason that we consume these vegetable oils or seed oils is because we're told that it lowers cholesterol and it, and it does, but this isn't a good thing. And, and if you were to Google this condition, cytosterolemia, cytosterolemia is uh, an inherited condition in which the body's ability to remove this toxic compound is reduced, which means the body stores more. Now, when it does that, and I encourage the listeners to do this, you know, go onto your search engine and, and look for cytosterolemia. You will see that this increase in phytosterols leads to an increased risk of, of heart attack, a heart disease, cardiovascular disease, which is the opposite to what we are told that consuming that compound does. And in there, you will realize in that moment that we need to remove these phytosterols. It competes with human cholesterol. We need cholesterol. Cholesterol isn't the demon that it's been made out to be. Eat real food, eat your animal proteins, um, and, and the rest becomes easy. You don't need to track. You don't need to count. Um, it's all about eating real food. Does that make sense? Yes, definitely. Yeah. And I think something that comes through and through is like, it's a very individualized approach. What's going to work for the one person might not work for the other person. So it's really, you know, what does say trial and error? I'm um, kind of figuring out what's going to work best for you, what's going to help you stay on track, what types of foods and, uh, you know, let's say low carb or ketogenic or carnivore, where, like what do you make, what makes your body feel the best? I know we're basically at the two hour mark, but there's actually two more questions. Do you mind if I ask them? No. Do you have some time to hang around? No, that's fine. Let's fire away. Okay. Amazing. So the next question is from Henry. And he's asking, what is your opinion on the movement saying food is not the problem and we should not restrict people and children uh, in terms of what they are eating? So it's, again, we've called this food addiction and, you know, f food is essential. We need food. And I think the addiction comes into um, synthetic compounds and sugar, um, sugar in particular. And again, sugar is highly addictive. Um any more than a teaspoon of sugar is detrimental to the body. Now, the the podcast that, that I recorded with Professor Norks recently, you know, he explained that sugar is a toxin in the body. This is why insulin is released to remove it and to store it into, into the muscle as glycogen in order to save your life. Unfortunately, sugar is available on every street corner. It's not seen as being harmful or a drug. Uh, now, when I walk down the street or go into a shop, all I see is 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 drugs all all over the wall um, because I understand what this compound is doing. And look, I'm not anti-carb. I'm not saying that the carbohydrates are bad. I'm saying that the overconsumption of, of carbohydrate is bad. Um, you don't need any carbohydrate. But when it's readily available in in, in that raw form and in synthetic forms, it leads to this addiction. It leads to insulin resistance. Insulin resistance um, damages the body. This is what leads to type 2 diabetes. And that is the root cause, along with inflammation, of every metabolic illness and disease that we know of. Um, so the carbohydrates and the seed oils, and seed oils actually cause a higher level of insulin resistance than carbohydrate does. So if you, if you were to just to remove one, then the seed oils would be the compound to remove. 
The problem with this is seed oils are found in every product, almost every product within the local supermarket. If you go into the local and try this, there's a test for you and, and post in the comments and let me know how you get on. Go into the supermarket, pick up a product that you think is healthy and look at the ingredients. One of the first ingredients on there is going to be some form of vegetable or seed oil, which is not fit for human consumption. These compounds were invented as machine lubricant and they've since found their way into, in, into our diet. You can run your diesel car on these vegetable oils. Um, but you wouldn't cook in diesel. So why are we consuming these compounds? Now, these compounds are so toxic that they don't come from vegetables. They come from seeds. They're extracted with toxic chemicals like hexane, and then they're bleached with hair dye, with peroxide, in order to give it that golden glow. Um, you know, you wouldn't drink peroxide either. So why are we consuming this toxic compound, which is leading to insulin resistance? Um uh, and, and lots of other issues within the body. This, this overconsumption of carbohydrate leads to glycation, uh, and the overconsumption of these vegetable oils leads to oxidation. This is what damages our cholesterol uh, and leads to uh, damage to our ApoB100 receptor, which is where all these issues start to come from in regards to, uh, to problems with cardiovascular disease. Um, and again, we probably uh, need a whole other hour to, to, in regards to get into this, but... Our cholesterol is good for us. Even LDL, LDL heals the body. LDL protects the body. And every L particle has this, this ApoB100 receptor. And this is the access card back to the liver. When it becomes glycated or oxidized, it, the liver no longer allows it access. And basically, it, and, and I'll go through this really quickly just to explain to the, to the listeners that want to know. This will circulate the body. And LDL is trying to still carry out and perform its original duty, which is healing and repairing the body. This is what LDL does. It heals and repairs the body. It's released from the liver. It drops its lipid cargo off to heal and repair the body. In what world is that damaging? It, 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 quite literally, this is what it does. It heals and repairs. But now that it, it no longer has access to the liver to be recycled, it finds its way into the damaged um, uh, arterial wall. So it travels into the subendothelial space where there are cells called macrophages. And these macrophages have, have receptors called scavenger receptors, which recognize this damaged ApoB100 receptor. They open up and they engulf this, this damaged particle and they cram lots of them in until this macrophage grows into a foam cell. And it's this foam cell that is the start of an atherosclerotic plaque. Now this came from originally glucose carbohydrate because carbohydrate wipes out the glycocalyx. The glycocalyx is a little brush border, if you like, on the arterial wall, which is the arterial wall's first line of defense. When that's wiped out, it exposes the subendothelial space. So we consume carbohydrate. We're told to eat little and often. Now, it takes 8 to 12 hours for the glycocalyx to recover. But if we are eating little and often, this glycocalyx is never recovering. Now, this is what sugar does. Sugar damages that glycocalyx. So again, I'm not anti-sugar, I'm not anti-carb, but the reality is this is what excess sugar consumption does. It destroys and damages our arterial wall. And then through that process of glycation and oxidation to the LDL particle, it leads to atherosclerotic plaques. So we need to remove, we need to remove or heavily reduce, you know, th this sugar. Um, and and I've probably gone off on one really tenfold. Sorry, Anna. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to say thank you because even us at the Nox Foundation, we, you know, on a personal level, one of the most the questions I get asked most is like, what about cholesterol? What about cholesterol? So thank you for explaining that because I'm sure there's, there's always going to be someone that's going to find a little bit of value just, you know, being reminded that we should, we, we don't have to fear cholesterol. For sure. We don't. But look, exactly. com coming back to the, to the original question, it's, it's, this overconsumption of sugar, it's not food. It's not food that we're against, but what is food? So let's clarify what food is. Food is anything that was once alive or directly hit by sunlight. Um, so any animals, any fish or any animal, for, for example, that, that's what food is, um, animal proteins. Um, and again, if you want to incorporate vegetables, go for the, the vegetables that contain the lowest amount of this carbohydrate. So vegetables that grow above the ground. Uh, but you don't have to consume vegetables. If you don't want to consume vegetables, every vitamin and mineral is found within animal proteins. And we can do another another live on this, Yana, if, if you'd like to go into, into detail in regards to the vitamin and mineral profile, which is actually truly found in just animal proteins. Um, 
but no but the the answer to the question 100 percent. this this isn't um this isn't a live uh you know slate in food we need food but sugar sugar in excess is not food and and that's what we need to to move away from is this this over consumption of these toxic compounds the sugary treats excess carbohydrates and these toxic seed oils we, we need to move away from those yeah, no, I, I agree. And unfortunately, nowadays, companies and marketing, all those foods are so highly palatable, especially when it comes to children. How are you going to expect of them not to want more of these things once they, they've tasted it? And I've got this, the last question, actually two questions, but I'm really just going to try and paraphrase and kind of squeeze them into one. And then you can just, uh, you know, try and see if you uh, can answer that for us. But it's basically talking towards, you know, the psychology behind food addiction and the, the importance of mindset and behavior change in terms of overcoming food addiction. And like how, what is, what role does psychology and perhaps things like trauma or past experience play in food addiction? And then how is food addiction different from other eating disorders? Yeah. So, I mean, again, you know, let's bring it down to, to, to sugar addiction. Um, but yeah, it's, Stress causes a big issue. I mean, we mentioned earlier on that, um, you know, excess stress within the body, and, th and this can be psychological or it can be um, uh, physical. You know, th these will produce stress hormones such as cortisol and adrenaline. Now, they interfere with the synthesis of serotonin, um, which leads to, to depression, insomnia, and eating disorders. Um, and also, you know, if we continue down, down this path uh, and we overconsume these compounds, it leads to insulin resistance. Now, insulin resistance also interferes with the absorption of that aromatic amino acid um, that we mentioned earlier, phenylalanine and tyrosine. Now, these create dopamine and epi uh, noepinephrine. Noepinephrine and dopamine are neurotransmitters that block irrelevant inflammation from the brain to help people concentrate. So lack of these uh, is associated with things such as uh, depression, anxiety, and even ADHD. Uh, because now the body is bombarded with lots of relevant information. So it, it comes back to, to basically trying to level off our stress hormones. Um, how do we do this? Well, eating the right sort of foods, not contributing to this with the overconsumption of sugar and um, the, these toxic seed oils. Uh, try meditation. Try getting out into, into the sun. Um Training, for example, being part of a social network, being part of a social network is incredibly important. When we look at the, you know, the, the, the history of blue zones, uh, we're told that blue zones are five locations in the world that lead to um, extended life. And, you know, we probably wouldn't have time to go into this, but it's, it's a fallacy in regards to the claims that are being made because they do eat lots of animal proteins within these areas. Uh, but they're also parts of the, of the globe that have incredible um, social networks. Um, we need friends and family. We're social beings, you know, as, as much as, you know, I, I spend a lot of my time by myself. I'm in my office and this isn't healthy. Uh, I'm in my office. I'm in my cave. Um, but this is what I do. Excuse me. So I don't get to see as much sun as I should. Um, and that's something that I need to work on. But all of these contributing factors help to to create a, a state, a, a level-minded state, if you like, a state of health and well-being. One of the things that I do is I listen to meditation music in the night. Um, so I'll put on high-frequency meditation music. Um, I've I've started to see a hypnotist to help with athletic performance, and this allows me to to go to a place, um, you know, my um, a, a place in my mind, you know, within my life. And for me, it's when my little girl was born and I remember holding my little, my, my, my little girl and she was absolutely tiny. And I remember the feeling that I had. So whenever I feel stressed, I'll sit down, close my eyes, I'll take three deep breaths in through the nose and out through the mouth. And I'll, and I'll go to this place where I think about that, that feeling that I felt at that time. You know, for you, it could be something else. But that's really important because we need to reduce this stress. Um... So meditation is a fantastic tool, but look, the stresses are only going to be compounded through the overconsumption of these toxic compounds. So we need to we need to cons we need to remove these toxic compounds, and also remember that if we can gravitate into a ketogenic lifestyle, the production of beta hydroxybutyrate, which is a ketone body, the master ketone body, this 
this is fuel for the brain. This breaches the blood-brain barrier when glucose can't. It lifts the brain fog. It alleviates depression and anxiety. It blocks inflammation throughout the body. Uh, and again, it, it allows us to, to increase this glutamate to GABA ratio and, and BDNF and all of these compounds and neurotransmitters within the brain. Just being ketogenic helps combat much of these symptoms. I used to suffer severely with anxiety and depression. And, and, I, and I mentioned earlier about my boxes in regards to how debilitating, you know, this was for me earlier in my life. Um, and now I'm out of my box. You know, I get the opportunity to speak with people such as yourself and to network and, and to do these public speaking events. And I, I genuinely would not have come on this call for a million pounds you know, previously when I suffered. And, and I genuinely, I genuinely mean that because my anxiety and depression was so bad. Once you start to remove these contributing compounds, these toxic compounds, which are, are leading to this elevation in cortisol, uh, this increase in, in adrenaline, um, then you will soon start to gravitate away from that. And, and another, another uh, contributing factor to this is excess coffee consumption. Now, I, I drink coffee. Um, I believe there are benefits to doing so, but there are dangers to doing so also. Now, excess coffee consumption will alter the glutamate to GABA ratio in a negative way, and this can contribute to anxiety and depression. So for people who are suffering severely with this, maybe lowering or removing the coffee could be uh, an, a, 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 an important tool. And also that coffee contains a compound called acrylamide. Acrylamide is a known neurotoxin. It's, it's created during the roasting process. So even decaf coffee contains this compound called acrylamide. Neurotoxins affect the way that the body produces neurotransmitters and how we, how we feel. So again, maybe removing or reducing coffee for, for a short spell will also help combat that anxiety and depression. Um, salt is incredibly important, and this is one that we didn't mention earlier. As we gravitate into this lifestyle, insulin drops quite literally overnight. So we, we're coming from a state of, of, of insulin resistance, and most of us are insulin resistant. And, and the way to tell is, is that central adiposity or a muffin top. If, if we have an overhang over our belt or our skirt or our trousers, then it's quite likely that we suffer with some form of insulin resistance. And we can't test this through blood glucose because insulin resistance begins 10 to 15 years prior to, to glucose being elevated. So insulin is released by the pancreas and it drives this glucose into the cell for years and years and years. But behind the scenes, this insulin is being elevated until it reaches a point where it cannot, re it cannot increase any further. And, and now we are diagnosed with, with an increase in uh, or, or pre-diabetes because blood glucose is beginning to increase and then diabetes. But this insulin resistance began 10 to 15 years prior. So what you do today has a massive impact on how you feel moving forward. But if you were to reduce carbohydrate today, by tomorrow, serum insulin would begin to drop. Now, insulin keeps sodium within the body. So in a state of insulin resistance, Insulin resistance is responsible for high blood pressure or essential hypertension. Excuse me. So when we are insulin resistant, the insulin will pull sodium from four points in the nephrons in the kidneys back into the blood. Wherever sodium goes, water follows. And that's what contributes to the high blood pressure. But it's not the sodium that caused this in the first place. It's the insulin resistance. As we combat this, now the sodium is being released from these four points of the nephrons in the kidneys. And now we're, we're in a sodium deficiency. And this is what leads to what we mentioned earlier in regards to the keto flu. Um, sodium is essential for life. It's, it's in all the foods that we eat, but now we are heavily devoid because we are also told to avoid sodium. And w there's, there's a study that I reference in my talks that covers 100,000 participants over 17 countries. And it looks at the correlation between so, so, uh, low sodium uh, consumption and all-cause mortality. And the lower we go, the higher the risk of death. Um, and maybe I can send you these and we can display them as, as infographics later. But we need sodium and we need a lot more than we're led to believe. But especially now that insulin is dropping. So we need to salt our meals with a Celtic sea salt or a, a pink Himalayan, a, a quality rock salt or sea salt, uh, or even um, a quality electrolyte. Um, 
we need to replace the, this the, this sodium in particular. Um, and again, electrolytes balancing electrolytes efficiently that's probably a talk for another day because we can go on to how we correct the potassium deficiency and combat hypokalemia um, and and even oxalate detox or, or oxalate dumping these are all things that come further down the line when we gravitate into this journey um but but these are the things that we need to implement so you know be, be wary of this make sure that we consume lots of salts um and, and also just one other thing uh yana i'd like to add as well is um when we gravitate into this lifestyle, um, there's, there's no perfect lifestyle. You know, we don't, I'm so far down my journey, but I didn't, I didn't wake up being carnival. I've made these incremental changes. So think of your journey as traveling on a bus or a train and you're traveling from one town to another, but now you're leaving, you, you know, you're leaving the standard diet town and now you're moving over to low carb and you get off the bus or a train in low carb town and you you feel brilliant. You've reduced carbohydrate. You're feeling great. Maybe that's where you want to stay. Maybe you're happy to stay in low carb town for the rest of your days. And if you do that, you're going to be considerably healthier and fitter than you were living this lifestyle over there. If you gravitate deeper down this down this journey on, on this, this bus journey or train journey and you move over to a dirty keto lifestyle or dirty keto town and then maybe a standard keto, a clean keto, all of these are terms in regards to different diets. The deeper down this journey you go, the more health benefits that you go into, you go into confer. But if you reach one of these locations that you're happy with and you feel that this is where that you, you want to reside and stay there because consistency is key. It's not worth becoming super strict and then realizing that oh, I've gone so strict, I can't maintain this any longer. It's all about these incremental changes, finding somewhere along your journey that you're happy to stay with until, you you know, you may find you're ready to move on to the next town. And who knows, maybe eventually you become more animal based and carnivore such as you and I, or you, you may even just res reside in low carb or even, you know, the keto town. But don't let anybody tell you that, what you're doing is incorrect because you are an individual. This is up to you. You need to make these choices yourself. And it's all about the rule and not the exception. And what allows you to maintain the journey is, is the key to success. Um, and, and just one other thing, sorry, Jan, I'd like to add is <laughs> going off. On, I told, I told, I told you this would happen, didn't I? But look, if, when, when we gravitate down this journey, um, we, we become disheartened because we may, stall along and this is a healing lifestyle and this is incredibly important to understand this is about healing and repairing the body but the bait that catches the fish initially is that weight loss this is why most people gravitate into this but the truth is it isn't about this the weight loss is a side effect of becoming healthy but should that be a driving factor for you i, I would recommend one that you try not to weigh uh, because it, it be, can become disheartening. Um, if you are going to 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 measure anything, I'd measure maybe with a caliper or even how loose your claws feel because the, the body will hold on to water at different times during your journey and not give a true reflection of this weight loss. And one other compound that may be slowing your progress is things like nuts and seeds. Um, nuts and seeds are also high in lectins. So um, if you are consuming nuts and seeds on your ketogenic journey, gravitate towards macadamia or pili nuts because these are lectin-free. Now, lectins, which we mentioned earlier, which are found in grains, they bind to insulin receptors and they signal the body to store five times more fat than the elicitation of insulin alone. And th this is, is usually a stumbling block for, for many people. Um, and they are addictive also because they contain a little bit of sugar, a little bit of fat, and it's all of the addictive compounds. Um, so if you are going to consume nuts, you know, almonds uh, are on the lower scale. Macadamia are completely lectin-free. Lectin Pili nuts are lectin-free. Just makes you gravitate towards the lower carb. But be mindful that these compounds, you know, do contain little bits of lectins. Um, and maybe, you know, we could do a whole other series on, you know, on this in the future in regards to foods to gravitate around the contain lectins and, and other compounds. Like there's been so many topics brought up in this conversation. <laughs> Like in my mind, like even now, like as we spoke, like, okay, I want to ask you this. I want to ask you more about this and this and this. But unfortunately, we have run out of time, which means we will definitely invite you back on to discuss this in more detail. And I really just love the way you explain these different concepts in a way that's more, much more easily to understand. 
you know, especially for someone that might not have a medical background or they might not know a lot of, you know, how does the body work, how does it function and all of these different compounds. And so thank you for doing that. Before we completely wrap up, I just have to go back to the comment section because I see there's a few more people that joined us and I just have to say hi to them. So Rolly joined us all the way from Milan and uh, Kania from South Africa, Sarah's watching from Sevilla, um, Alison all the way from Scotland, um, Janice Peters from Illinois, USA, Debbie from the UK, Selena from Wales, uh, Joe, saying fantastic as usual rich um oh i see we actually got more questions about electrolytes and um oxalates that was actually also something that i was now thinking would be such an interesting discussion um so we would definitely invite you back so we can spend more time on some of those specific topics which is obviously also requested by our audience members so thank you so much for joining us as we wrap up maybe you can just quickly tell our um audience and listeners how can they reach you um how can they learn more about the work that you do oh brilliant yana f first of all thank you so much for inviting me to come on it's been an absolute pleasure it's always a pleasure chatting um and yeah as you can see i it doesn't take much to uh to get me to to to, <laughs> to, to, to open up um yeah, uh, I'm on uh, Instagram as keto underscore pro. Uh, also, uh, my personal profile is Richard underscore Anthony underscore Smith. Um, so feel free to follow me on there. Um, the website uh, is uh, theketopro.com. Um, so on there, uh, you know, we stock these and manufacture things like foods and electrolytes and, and little products that can help you maintain your journey. But on there, we have a free recipes page with hundreds of free recipes. There's a Q&A page. Uh, and also there's links on there to um, the private group that I mentioned. Um, I'm also on Facebook. Um, again, that, that, that link will all be on the website or on Instagram. If you go to Instagram and you click on um, the, the link tree in my Instagram, it will open up links to some fantastic resources, including the Noakes Foundation. <laughs> so there's, there's lots of fantastic links on there. Um, I go live on YouTube. Um, every Sunday at 7 p.m. So I go live with a colleague of mine, Stephen. We go live at 7 p.m. every Sunday, GMT, um, for an hour. We go live on Rumble after that for 30 minutes. This Sunday, we're live twice. So we, we, we are having a special guest on Sunday at 12 p.m. GMT. Dr. Anthony Chafee is joining us again. Um, so we're going to have a live, live Q&A with, with Dr. Chafee. Um, and again, I also go live within my private group, which is free to join. Anybody can join uh, at 5 p.m. GMT on Mondays. And the reason that we do this is the same reason that you and I have, have done this live today. It's it's an opportunity for people to ask questions uh, for free so they, they, can, they can come on. They can ask any burning questions and we can relay this information. Um, I do, I do uh, private consultations also. So if anybody, you know, wants a more in-depth, uh, personal uh, approach taken, you know, it, um, uh, I also offer that as, as a private service and I, all of these are available in the link tree, but um, please, if you do follow us on YouTube, please subscribe because my content is free. I, I'm not monetized. I don't make a penny off YouTube. Um, so I don't charge for the content that I put out, but uh, the more subscribers that I get, um, the, the the easier it is for me to to create content and, and spread the word. So uh, it all affects the algorithm on YouTube. So the more people that subscribe and comment and like uh, allows us to spread the good word. And you know, with your with your blessing, Yana, you know, I'd be posting this to YouTube so everybody can see this and again promoting the the, the fantastic Nox Foundation further. Um, yeah, and that's me. Amazing. Thank you so much again, Richard. It was, I mean such amazing conversation you shared a wealth of knowledge with us today definitely a few things that i'm gonna go read up on more so thank you so much and then thank you to all our listeners our audience members thank you for joining us and keep an eye out on our facebook page as we will soon be interviewing some more amazing people like richard and we will i'm sure see him again soon thank you so much everyone bye